Welcome to today's episode of Flowmeter Guy, where the currents of wit and wisdom flow as smoothly as the meters we discuss and the people who use them. Today, we are honored to welcome a distinguished guest who is an expert in test and balance industry and renowned for his remarkable success in building a thriving business. So, young man, what's your name and what do you do for a living? Well, Brent, Joel Shannon. I uh, am CEO of Research Airflow, Mm -hmm. amongst many other things, which we'll get into, I'm sure. So you are what based here in the Atlanta area. Our headquarters is in Atlanta, oh. and uh, that's where we were founded in 1977. And uh, we've got offices in Charlotte, Charleston, and Raleigh. Well, you're busy guys. So when you're not running your business, what kind of activities and hobbies do you have that uh, bring you fulfillment outside your busy life? So I really enjoy hiking. Do you? Yeah. And uh, your wife and I have talked about that yeah. on some trips. She's she's quite the adventurer. But, uh, she's the adventurer, but not as, as much as you. You're yeah. actually doing it. We just talk about it. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. Uh, lately, I've gotten very busy with a lot of extracurricular work uh, stuff and organizations I'm serving with. And mm-hmm. it's kind of taken away from the, the hiking, but um, I enjoy hiking. I also enjoy ham radio. Ham radio. Ham radio. Amateur radio. Amateur call it, radio. Call it ham for slang. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I have a lot of fun. I've got a pretty nice station at the house. It's currently. I saw, yeah. If you can take a look at these pictures there, the station or house is a very nice broadcast station from yeah. an old radio guy. It looks pretty fancy. Yeah. That's all modern stuff. I've got some antique tube type radios as well really? and amplifiers and antennas hidden very nicely so the can, can you help us with our internet service here maybe maybe no? maybe i have okay. to call call uh, elon musk see what he can do yeah some him. starlight or whatever yeah. else they have there so this is a hobby but as we talked earlier it's quite in depth you're actually providing some services as well yeah um a lot of the ham radio community gets involved with emergency communications mm-hmm. in case there's hurricanes or uh, you hear if you've ever heard of weather radio, you hear somebody say, we need spotter activation in this area. So um, they have people that are trained for skywarn nets and things like that. They have what they call nets on the radio. So if you start hearing thunder or seeing some yeah. warnings on TV, I always flip on my ham radio. I've got a handheld I keep in every room of the house just about. Really? And, yep. And so we've got wide coverage repeaters that... To, are on mountaintops all over North Georgia, so they cover a real wide area, and they link all those together all the way down to South Georgia. So if we've got a f- something coming in from Carrollton or somewhere mm-hmm. like that heading across Atlanta, we'll know about it hours before it gets here, and somebody in the Peachtree uh, City Weather Service office is connected to this net, a meteorologist, and if feed them information about the storm patterns so that's and what damage. The real-time information, that's basically, real-time. from the guy with the Doppler radar. He's just got big screens, basically, with a bigger picture. Exactly. That's about the boots that. on that the ground. Is, so. That's amazing. But uh, I actually took my love for hiking and ham radio and mixed them together. Yeah. And I do something called Summits on the Air. Summits uh, on the Air. We call it SOTA for short, and uh, S-O-T-A. And so I hike to the top of mountains, all over the world. I've been hiked in Ireland. Um, wow. Big. Hadn't been to coast. I've been to Costa Rica. Didn't get to yeah. you know, do a mountain there, but I've done some in uh, all over the United States. Um, I've got a picture you're probably going to be showing uh, on top of Jane Bald, and that is on the Appalachian Trail. On the Appalachian Trail, yeah. And that sits right on the uh, border of North Carolina and Tennessee in Roan Mountain, Tennessee. Mm-hmm off of Carver's Gap. And so that's a hike I was doing, doing ham radio there. And uh, another shot I've got is, you, you saw the big radio station. Sure, yeah, quite so a I've, station. So I've got a station that I carry on, I've got several that I carry on mountaintops. But if I'm going on a long hike, up a lot of elevation gain, yeah. I'll carry 
real small. We call them QRP. That means low power radio, mm-hmm. and it's small. I've got one about the size of a deck of playing cards. Right. Puts out three to four watts. I've contacted New Zealand with it. Really? Yes. And it's Morse code only. So, I, I mean, it's an old school. It's a digital if communication, it works, by the if way. If it works. If yeah. it works. So, the purpose of going up the higher mountains mm-hmm. is to get a better ele- elevation. And then for your antenna, you get better coverage then, I assume. Yeah, and yeah. some exercise. And so, <laughs> so they, <laughs> that's why he has to do Morse code, going, <laughs> climbing yeah. up the mountains there. So we, we carry portable antennas and string them up. I've got yeah. a picture of one that sometimes we throw them up over a tree. The picture I'm on gotcha. that I've provided for you is from uh, Dante's Peak. Oh, really? Which is almost 7,000 foot above Death Valley. So yeah. in the picture you can see in the valley down there, that's a Death Valley. And, that's quite a hike. Yeah, and that portable mast that's set up that you see an antenna sloping from, uh, when it's collapsed, is about 28, 32 inches. And with it fully extended, it's about 30 feet long. Oh, really? Yeah. So I carry that to the top of a mountain. Oh, goodness. And slope an antenna. And the takeoff angle from the radiation of the antenna because of the slope of the mountain gives you a better takeoff angle oh wow and you're able to you got some math better, involved here too better okay. trajectory of your radio wave hitting the ionosphere and bouncing down on the so other that's side all about planet. right that's i've yeah. read it's all about the bouncing to get your signal farther and farther like you said you're talking yeah. to people all over the world yeah that's so it's amazing. a lot of fun a lot of fun during covid um there, there's a guy that sells a service for people that live in apartments and can't put up big towers and yeah. so forth. So he's got a remote radio station you can connect to over the <laughs> internet and talk to people all over the world through a radio station on a tower. So Isn't that something? His towers are um, located in Maine, like right on the ocean. Mm-hmm. And it's the farthest station in America, closest to East, Europe. Yeah. And so during COVID when all the, you know, Italy was shut down. Right. Uh, he was talking to people over there, and they were telling you what's going on and where they can go That's and where amazing. they can't go. And so getting, you know, you're like, what do you talk about? You know, and and who you talk to? But you you find out about people and their way of life, and it just makes the big world a little smaller. Isn't that something? It's cool. Yeah. That is a Made fun a hobby. Toys. There. It's a lot of work. You got a lot of toys there. You've obviously experienced how it works there, and you said. The organization itself, there's other people that are joined with this whole thing. So oh, yeah. you're not the only one. It's a family. No. Wow. Yeah. What else? Thank goodness there. So you mentioned you had some musical skills as well. Yeah. So uh, your your tech here told me not to bang not on the table. Not to bang table. on the table. <laughs> so I've, I play the drums. I've been playing. I'd like to know how long I've been playing, but... Uh, I think I, I got a set with paper heads on it called the Noble Oval or something when I was five years old yeah. and immediately destroyed it within five <laughs> minutes. And uh, so uh, my mother, she went to went to meet one of my teachers for a conference when I was real young. And she's teacher said, you know, Joel's a good boy. He's, he's, he's going to make a good citizen. He's, he'll fit in with some civic duties and volunteer work and all, but can you please get him to quit beating on stuff? And my, <laughs> my mother said, you figure that one you out. You figure that me. out, huh? Let me know. Ba-da-bump, 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 ba-da-bump. Well, my favorite uh, uh, music we looked at this morning is uh, the solo of uh, Inagata de Vida. So you oh, probably yeah. know that very well. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should play that music in the Iron background there. Iron Butterfly. Iron Butterfly. My dad used to listen to that. My dad was a guitar player. Was he? And so his love for music, I, I grew up listening to CCR and all kind of cool yeah. stuff from his era. And we would play music together. So Isn't that something? There? That was a lot of fun. That's why I know those long songs 100 years ago when I worked oh, at a man. radio station. The guy for the next shift was always late. Yeah. So I'd put a record on of either Tubular Bells or Inagata de Vida because it had a and long play. Good. And then I'd take off and he'd come in the next 10 or 15 minutes and show up. And then nobody knew I wasn't in, no one's in the studio. So yeah. that's what we learned from those. That's cool. But I play, play drums. Um, I've played in various bands. Now I play at church. Yeah. I'm there playing most every weekend. And I'm um, in a all original Christian rock band yeah. called Lifeline. And we... Yeah. We uh, go to prisons and do prison yeah. ministry and play for captive audience. The captive audience there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, wow. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It keeps you out of trouble there. So, 
So uh, you went to school and you said then things kind of changed. So tell me about, uh, let's, let's start on the journey. How did Joel really get his feet planted and end up where he is today? So kind of walk us through the, the story about that. So yeah, um, growing up with my dad playing music and all, he was uh, real involved in my life and um, he would get me to work on everything with him. Mm -hmm. So and there's a cool meme on or a little video or something going around on social media that uh, kids nowadays don't know the pain of holding the flashlight for their father. There you go. Because you, you get cussed out quite a bit. Yep. Uh, Put it right there. I said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoever invented the headlamp yeah. should get the Nobel Peace Prize. There you go. You're out of job there. I yeah. hear you. Yeah. But anyway, I, I worked with Dad on the weekends around the house. I'd say, what are we going to do for fun, Dad? You know? Clint and Brian, they're going deer hunting or fishing or camping or something. What are we going to do? He said, we're going to work. And uh, <laughs> so we'd go out and oh, yeah. dig a foundation for a garage or replace a window in the house or, you know, just crazy stuff, always working. And then when I got old enough to uh, work on projects, which it was at a very young age, you can probably see from the picture that's going to be shown. Yeah. Started very young. Started young there, huh? Yeah, I like the hard hat there. Dad drug me to a um, to a project one time when I was real young, and we were doing a high school. And uh, he said, "Quit asking me questions. Just, just here. I'm going to give you something to do. Some, you know, the, these days you would be put in jail for this kind of thing. Uh -huh. But Dad carries me to the roof. I'm like, <laughs> I don't. I'm not even a teenager yet. He carries yeah. me to the roof and, and hands me a nut driver." Yeah. And it, there's like 150 exhaust fans <laughs> on this roof. And he says, every one of these covers, you know, I need you to yeah, take those off there, pull these off and flip them, put the bolts in your nuts right. in them. And, and, and we're going to go around and get the nameplate information, drive sizes and all this stuff. And I said, OK, great. So he he goes back down. I figure out in about two seconds that I can just push down on it to depress the rubber isolators and just flip the nuts off. So, yeah. In a few minutes, I'm back down. Dad, what you want me to do next? You can't be done yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You f I figured <laughs> it, huh? You f yeah. So I would work with him on uh, weekends and, uh, and during the summer when I wanted to buy a drum set or something. There you go. Go kart or something. He there would say, go. come work and you can earn some money. And so I would go with him, work on projects. So I got exposed to test and balance at a young age. And then my love for ham radio i got involved with that at a fairly young age so when i graduated high school i had a love for electronics mm -hmm. and so i decided i'd go to night school um the cab tech and take some electronics courses and i really enjoyed that and dad was saying ah you need to learn about hvac so i enrolled in some hvac classes there mm -hmm. at night and not a real good student but you know i that's <laughs> I was going to give it up, give it my all, and dad, yeah. dad landed a big project in Augusta, and he said, uh, son, we're, we're going bankrupt if you don't quit school and uh -oh. help me finish this job. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, what, what are you going to say? Huh? I said, okay, dad, I'll, I'll, I'll take one for the team. So uh, went to Augusta, ended up being there four years. It's a long job. Isn't there a song, Augusta, Georgia, is just no place to be? No place to be for yeah, sure. Yeah, so I can I can testify. That's yeah. A, there's nothing Smells, in between. Oh, so, man. Yeah. You know? uh, paper mills rolling in there. Yeah. Right. But we, we had a lot of fun. That was probably the worst job I ever worked. That was the worst job. Yeah. And the best. Yeah. Because that taught me perseverance. Had, taught you perseverance. We had a lot of problems on that project. We had to uh, rebuild thermostats, do things that we don't even do as test mm -hmm. balance people. But, yeah. Uh, Compressed air system filled up with water yeah. all the way to the fifth floor. And you could go open an, an air valve right. and it would fill up buckets of water. You know, that's not supposed to happen in compressed I air. I guess system. not. So I got to uh, rebuild the thermostats and clean the diaphragms in them and, and calibrate them. And we sold that service for right. a customer and uh, ended up scuba diving. That's another thing that scuba diving. I didn't mention that to you. Uh, but I didn't know HVAC was underwater. Before I got married. <laughs> yeah, another before I got married story. Before I got married. Yeah. I was a cave diver. What? Yes. I, I, I 
spent several years training to go back and do underwater exploration kidding. in caves in northern Florida and spring systems. Wow. So you don't, you're not claustrophobic then? No. And <laughs> believe it or not, in a cave, yeah. being confined yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. I have been in rooms in a cave where we had these halogen lights right. that are ridiculously bright. Right. Battery packs like this. Can't say anything? You can shine in any direction, up, down, up or down, side, front to back, and not see anything but water. And that's scary because you can get dis disorder. And this is in Florida? I heard it's nothing but a honeycomb, basically, yeah, Florida. Is it, it's amazing. All these aquifers and springs right. underground. But uh, I guess the longest dive that I did was with six tanks. A little wow. Over, a little over four hours. That's a long. Decompressing with uh, pure oxygen at 20, 30 feet. Oh, of depth for hours. Oh, and geez. And that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, well, I digress. But while I was in Augusta, I did some scuba diving at Clark's Hill Reservoir where there's three foot long alligator gar in this lake. Oh, Man, geez. It's unreal. I got snappy teeth. And oh, geez. Yeah. Unbelievable. So uh, you mentioned that. Let's tell our audience what, what is test and balance. Give me a quick uh, hmm. breakdown. The elevator pitch. So, what is it? So fluids, mm -hmm. air or water, mm -hmm. as you deal with. Right. That's a flow meter part. That was a that's, ticket to get in. That's a flow meter. Okay. Yeah. So air and water are not very intelligent. They take the path, and they're lazy. They take the path of least resistance. Right. So um, you turn on a, a system, a pump, a fan, mm -hmm. the fluids are going to go wherever they can get to. The engineer has designed systems to have to have certain amounts of airflow or water flow to cool or heat, uh, dehumidify. A, and a humidify, building or facility. Building okay. or facility. Okay. And so we basically push fluids around mm -hmm. with dampers and valves and validate that they meet the design. We, we, that's in the simplest terms. Mm -hmm. but we also take temperatures and prove energy exchange and uh, try to tune systems and calibrate sensors so that they're optimally operating for the best efficiency and least energy use and it's it's exciting it pays the bills it's another another niche market it is a very niche market but it has a need and uh so you uh after you got done scuba diving in augusta then uh, basically you came back to the organization here in the yeah. atlanta area and yep. uh then what did you do after that so my dad uh, was working out of town in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Did oh. some work at a, at a base out there. And uh, he was overwhelmed because most of the company was in Augusta finishing this project. He was trying to do some military work up on the coast. And uh, you know what it's like to be the chief cook and bottle washer, sure. having to wear all the hats before you get a team and delegate and all this. But uh, he was he was overwhelmed a little bit, mm -hmm. and he had, he had prayed that the Lord would send him a business partner. And he was out of town, you know, away from Atlanta. He's right. like, he's at, he goes down to this hotel lobby, you know, you know what it's like eating on the sure. road and you're by yourself. Yeah. He, he's sitting in the lobby, and he looks across the lobby, and Here's Charles Derrick, and it's a guy he worked with at Tab Services years and years, years ago. Years ago, and that was also in the Atlanta area. Also in okay. Atlanta. And uh, Charles had had a son who's now my business partner, mm -hmm. Kevin. Charles had a background in cotton farming and chicken farming. Cotton and chicken farming, okay. Yes, so he had a farm in Alabama and put Kevin through high school there and did farming, and then when... Kevin graduated and went into the reserve with the Navy. He, mm -hmm. Charles said, I'll come back to, it, to Atlanta and get back into test and balance. So he was okay. working with Tab at the time. And um, Dad looks over at this restaurant, and there's Charles sitting there. He's like, wow, come on over. So uh, I actually got a picture of Charles and Dad at yeah. the, where, from where they worked with Tab years and years mm -hmm. and years ago. And they were at the battery in Charleston 
and climbed up on those cannons. You ever been there? I've never been there. So it, it, uh, along the walk by the ocean there, mm -hmm. they've got all these old cannons right. and cannonballs and stuff. It's called the battery. And it said Charles and Dad got up on, on top of this cannon, took, took pictures of each other. And uh, Charles, you see him, he's got his aviators on. He, he was a helicopter pilot. Right. Three tours in Vietnam. How about that? Yeah. Became an instructor. And, uh, I bet. He, he's an he's amazing, amazing man. But uh, anyway, I digress. Those two reconnected after all those years. And um, they, you know, sat down, ate dinner. And my dad said, you know, I've been praying I'd meet somebody that would go into business with me and help. And he said, well, I've been kind of thinking about the same thing. And <laughs> boom, they came together and Charles, um, Charles and my dad were completely different. My dad was very technical mm -hmm. and Charles was very people oriented yeah. and had the, just, I mean, he could sell anything yeah. and it just amazing. And everybody loved him a real charismatic guy. So, um, they ended up, just as a match made in heaven, literally. And so they uh, they started working together, growing the business, and it has just exploded since then. That's amazing. But uh, that's how things got going. Um, that was probably in the early 90s, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, Dad had started the business in 77. So he'd been going a while for... Sure. He had a, a, a business partner in between there, and he went into the sheet metal industry and... They split, split ways and mm -hmm. just divided up the company. But uh, Dad met Charles, and then Kevin was working on a mushroom farm. He graduated a mushroom from, farm. Yeah, he graduated from Auburn with a degree in economics and uh, agricultural economics. There you go. So he was in Florida in the heat, shoveling. Yeah. <laughs> the things you put on top of That's mushrooms. Right. The things you put on top of mushrooms. Yeah, there. yeah, and. Uh, yeah. Charles called him up with a similar sad yeah. story. Hey, we're in trouble, and uh, you know I think you could make a good career up here. And so he packed up his wife, and I can't go. remember if he had a kid at that time or not, but maybe his son was born, and he moved up and uh, got busy learning test and balance. And then Kevin and I eventually purchased the company from our fathers, and they mm -hmm. retired. And Kevin and I, like our fathers, are – completely different wired different all the way around are they yeah i see that you were uh uh we have a plaque here that uh, you were honored recently my father was he yeah. he uh we, we people that are familiar with test and balance and they were certified with neb and national environmental balancing bureau mm -hmm. and uh we have local chapters our local chapter is the mid-south chapter mid-south okay and my dad served as the president at least I don't know, multiple years. He was he mm -hmm. was president of the chapter. He served as the technical committee chairman for many, 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 many years until he retired. And uh, a few years back, our chapter came up with the Founders Award. So Neb's got the George Hightower Award. He's mm -hmm. one of the guys right. that helped start Neb. He was a flying tiger in the world, too. <laughs> Great guy. I got to do a project for him once. But well. uh, Anyway, um, they decided we're going to have a prestigious award, and it's only been awarded, I think, three times now. And really, they awarded that to my dad. Oh, that's great! Yeah, yeah. I saw the plaque of that recently. We'll show posthumously. That that, they gave it to him, and I received it on his behalf in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Right. So we, we get to that's great. We get to hang out with some cool people on those research and yourself included there you go so you mentioned these organizations that you you mentioned neb and some other organizations there what's the purpose of these organizations oh uh, wow what are they they just training or guidelines or what's so we've got a lot of core values in neb that have to do with uh you said neb stand for national environmental balancing bureau that's what it originally stood for, okay. yes and i think it's now it's just known as neb, neb. okay but, but neb has some core values that have to do with um integrity mm -hmm. and and doing quality work putting out top quality publications and education and they serve as a certification body for p 
people that do what we do mm -hmm. and hold a standard that creates standards, standards. and procedures. Then, standards okay. and procedures, and uh, it, they've got a fantastic staff mm -hmm. that uh, works really hard in the uh, Baltimore, Washington D.C. Sure. area. And but the backbone, <clears throat> excuse me, the backbone of the organization is volunteers. The old volunteers. Like myself. Yeah. So you have board members, um, executive finance committee members, and mm -hmm. then there are guys that work tirelessly. I mean, the hours they put in mm -hmm. is unbelievable on like the tab committee, the clean room committee, uh, standards, test development committee. These guys are just, they've got normal jobs. And right. They go work on these tasks for free. And, and that's something. So that's the, the love the of the industry, industry to keep the industry. And at the same token, everybody wants to share the knowledge yeah. on how to do this. And I understand there's a hard time getting young people back in the business. That just uh, people, what's the reason for that? We're seeing a change in that. Are you? We really are. You know, for a while, everyone was going to college. Yep. And then, you know, micro and the dirty jobs thing. And he's been preaching it for a while that, you know, you need to give the trades a try. Right. And now you've got these Skills USA competitions and uh, building trades organizations going to high schools and talk, you know, they did away with the shop classes in a lot of the high sure. schools. I was big into shop sure. classes in high school. And uh, so nowadays, you've got businesses going to these career fairs and explaining to these kids, hey, you can go to work and make this much money and be working towards a retirement. Kids don't care about retirement. They're like, what's that? You know, what's I'm that, never right? going to die. Yeah, no, I'm never going to die. I'm retire right. and bulletproof, whatever. Right. But uh, when they hear that their friends that have gone on ahead of them have graduated and they're working for chump change with a gazillion people competing for the same job. Right. And they've got a mountain of school debt, you know, college debt that they have Indeed. to pay off. It's it's tough. So we're with uh, with getting the young people comes the challenges of immaturity and <laughs> and things like that. Where you know, teenagers think they know everything, but we've actually got some incredible some of some of the brightest new hires that we've had have come out of high schools and really. Yeah, we've got one gentleman that works with us now. Um, he was the valedictorian of his high school class. Really? That's great. And he is getting involved with NEB, mm -hmm. the national organization. They've got a young professionals network, the YPN is what they What's call the it. What's the age in that now? I think it's anything under 40. Under 40, yeah. I thought and it was so younger hard, than that before. It's hard to get up there. You know, some, some geezer to run the thing and have young people <laughs> interested in it. But they... They're having these happy hour events and and doing uh, lots of things to work on things like AI. And, yeah, you know AI is getting crazy and it's amazing what you can do with it. But uh, so we've got task force for AI and and Neb. We've got um, the the Young Professionals Network, and that's getting young people involved even before they're certified. Mm -hmm. We're not even waiting on them. You know, if you've got got a good interest and you're making a difference in your company and organization we're going to help well, i see that i see a strong sense of camaraderie oh, and then yeah. the uh the good old boys is a really strong sense of passing on the knowledge mm -hmm. more so we were members of many organizations and it's not a secret of what you do you want everybody to know how you do it and uh they have these chapter meetings which i attend around the country there it's all educational and it's all as much hands-on you'd like. And now that's another thing that you mentioned, you're involved with uh, some of the testing programs recently. So, Yeah, so I'm I'm involved at the chapter level. I'm a past president of our NIB local chapter mm -hmm. from Mid-South. Uh, yeah. I've been the technical committee chairman since, I guess, 2012, maybe. Lucky you. Yeah, I get to sign everybody's <laughs> applications and all that. But, um, I was lucky enough to volunteer and go to Jacksonville, Florida, when I was uh, a little younger, and they've got a test lab down there. Right. We didn't have one in Georgia, so we could volunteer to proctor, and they'd pay you to come proctor. Sure. So when I was young and my kids were real little, I'd say, you want to go to the beach this weekend? Yeah. <laughs> Dad's going to be giving tests. Yeah, now, but you and mom can hang out and go to the yeah. beach. So, so uh, got some proctoring under my belt there and uh, became a NIB-approved proctor, and 
so recently. We've got this new test lab in Columbus, Georgia, for giving the NIB practical exam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went down in the past couple of weeks ago. I guess we just did our very first certification exam and okay. got that vetted with NIB. We had had someone from the NIB office come down and bless it and bless it. And we had several guys from the chapter that were becoming proctors, and uh, so. I serve on the board still with uh, with NIM vice president now at uh, MIB. It's me. MIB, I and I'm also on the board. I just saw you on the Nash. national board too. Yeah, they they asked me to if I'd come on board. I said sure. If I can help, I'll be glad. Yeah. So I also am a member of SMACNA, and I'm on the local Georgia chapter board working with SMACNA. It's a sheet metal air conditioning contract. So the big purpose of, of being involved with these, aside from educationals on the on the projects that you work on, are specifications required then to call out these organizations that you have these skills? They do. Okay, so that's part of the marketing. And if you're if you're involved at the grassroots level, you get your voice heard for things that impact you and your business. Mm -hmm. But uh, the biggest benefit I've seen is that you're working with the cream of the crop people Are you? all over the all over the world. You know, uh -huh. Luis, you're going to have him on. I heard yeah. maybe for a for a podcast. Like sure, sure. Luis is amazing. He's he's, no, very, he's he's the president of the the NEBS organization currently. Yes, and he's he's very focused and a great leader. But you know, if you weren't volunteered, you wouldn't get exposed to the way people look at things, and then. Finding out about the culture where he's he's from Costa Rica, Costa Rica, right? And you find out about what challenges they have there. Mm -hmm. You find out um, people on the West Coast they deal with a completely different set of challenges than the East Coast. A lot of oh red yeah. tape and you no, know, I go into you know. a West Coast meeting and they'll say, "What do you think about this uh, uh, Section twelve thirty four or five blah blah blah?" Yeah, it's only indicative to people in California in the Bay Area or something like that. Exactly. And I said, "That's interesting." Uh, South flow meters. Uh, but it's only that chapter. And so yeah. when everybody gets together, they get to share some notes to figure out what's making it practical for everybody. So supposedly what happens on the West Coast goes to the rest of the country. Right. I, a lot of ways I hope not, but in some ways that, that could be good. But you're on the cutting edge of learning about those things if you're volunteering. Mm -hmm. And so that it, it you you hear the old adage, you've heard it a million times, you get, what, get out of it what you put into it. And uh, you know. You you get, yeah. you you were sharing with me this morning all the people that you've met volunteering and thank you so much for being at the national and the local recertifications and providing educational uh, well opportunities and I go to these meetings because I don't really have any friends so it's the only way to get to meet people so that's the main reason we go <laughs> and Brent has been after me for years let me do a marketing piece for you let me do something for your chapter let me do something and it, he, he asked me if I'd come be on his show and I, I'd well, say well we're going to get to talk about Brent have, some so yeah I'll do that that would uh, be great we have lots of fun to do things like that so you basically your organization you built a nice organization and you have multiple offices too right yes where you're based out of that one here in Atlanta area Yes, our uh, next office that we established was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And we've typically, we, we don't have the mindset of taking over the world, you know, or, or anything yeah. like that. It's customers are in that market. They've expanded and they said, hey, will you come support us? Mm -hmm. Or we have an employee that, hey, I'd kind of like to have an opportunity to try something different. So if we've got those two elements we'll go explore another market. And that's the way Raleigh came to be. Well, that's an interesting then. What kind of markets are you are? I mean, I look at your, your it says on the website you have over, was it 25,000 projects of every scope. That's and pretty I mean, old. That's We're pretty up 40 old. 40,000 projects. <laughs> uh, and so with that yeah. in mind, you have multiple offices and I yeah. see your data centers and just a thumbnail of what kind of businesses that you'd get involved in. Is it? Oh, we do, a, we do a lot. We used to, the bread and butter was, Office buildings, office tenant buildings, renovations, yeah. and mm -hmm. small what they call turn work, uh, sure. tenant renovations. With the pandemic and people working from home, the office market is dried up, and so that we thought we'd just be seeing a big downturn in work. Mm -hmm. It's been gangbusters. Really? Yeah, we're 
were involved heavily and have been for years with healthcare market, working in hospitals, mm -hmm. laboratories. We do air change testing and operating rooms and isolation rooms, which are pretty popular during pandemics and things I bet. like that. So, no, I bet. Uh, keeping those certified up to speed, then the data centers uh, with the AI market and people working remotely, there's a there's a big need for data centers and housing servers all over the place and Amazon's replaced you know, the we get, brick and mortar stores. So everything's data center. Driven. So, and then so cases there, you're also, we've done some projects with you that in addition to test and balance, was just flow surveys basically collecting. Yeah. So you're basically doing a discovery process, the data center, how much water are we using? And then you may recommend solutions to, uh, to optimize the facility that you have there. Yep. So uh, if there's water in a pipe, I'm involved. I do a little bit of air, but you're doing water and air. And at the same time, you're analyzing the system mm -hmm. and making recommendations to maybe a contractor or a building owner said, you know what, if you did this and this and this, you might be able to enhance your system and save a little money. It really comes down to money, really, to get down exactly. to the whole thing, doesn't it? Exactly. I talked to an industry leader, customer of ours that's doing a lot of data centers, and he said that the... Uh, Data center market's shifting more now. At one time, it was heavily sheet metal involved, mm -hmm. like ductwork involved. Now it's more direct water cooled. So when you're seeing more fluid from your end, uh, in row coolers, power distribution units. Yeah, that's what I see. It's the I have no idea. Some of the facilities say how much water consumption the oh, data centers that that makes an impact on a community a big time. So it's a big it's deal. And they're moving some more here in the Atlanta area as well. Just yeah. seeing all the. Uh, trying to get tax abatements to get these big guys in, but it's a price yeah. where you're you're taking all their utility services that other people may have limited access to. But, hey, get off the internet, huh? Yeah. So, <laughs> And we were very blessed to pick up uh, plant Vogel work. We did oh, the really? Two reactors. The nuclear plant, okay. Yeah, the, the, those are the two first reactors that have come online in decades right. in the United States. So, And they're both currently online and uh, operating well, and that provided a lot of work for us. That's your, so you diversified. How many people do you have now? I'd have to stop. And count. He's guessing. So, somewhere around 90 employees total. Yeah, it's, well, a, it's a lot. And you have time to come visit me. That's amazing. Oh, I've always got time to come <laughs> see Brent, man. It's, that is it's a, a lot of fun. you got a great of, facility here. It's a lot of people to, uh, to organize. And yeah. so, as you said, you're up to 40,000 projects right now. That's amazing. Mm. Uh, multiple offices there. So, a um, couple of thoughts. Yeah. To kind of wrap this whole thing around. So you're you're a busy guy, got all kinds of hobbies, mm -hmm. you're growing your business in the spare time, you're in radio, uh, and a, and a band, a church, mm -hmm. and uh, taking care of family, yep. and uh, you got a couple of dogs. Oh can't, yeah, can't forget the dogs. Got two dogs. Got two dogs. Got to take care of, and uh, uh, and the family. And uh, so the thoughts are, you shared a lot of knowledge and, and how you got there. And uh, it's obviously part of that is your your spirit and how you've got from point A to point B. And second thing is character, the way you're working with people. Because the whole thing is just the way you network with people, quite sure. frankly. Sure. And now you got to network with all these employees. In fact, I just interviewed somebody recently. I said, if you did something again, what would you do? He said, I wouldn't have any employees. It had to have been Derek. Yes, yeah, so it was Derek. So uh, <laughs> with that in mind, uh, it's this part of the equation. Yeah. It's part of the equation. So if you had to go back in time to your former self when you started this business, what advice would you give to yourself now that you've gone through this journey? What would you do significantly different or not at all? I would say the biggest secret to success is to take care of people, mm -hmm. your employees, your customers, and to serve others. Um, I've kind of done that mm -hmm. in, in an increasing amount since I began, but, uh, you know, if you ask me what would I do different or what bad mistakes did I make, we don't have enough time to cover <laughs> all of that today. <laughs> what but, it could have, should have. What it could have, should have. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I think uh, being grounded, having having a faith, you know, I've told you I'm a Christian. Uh, one of the secrets of ha happiness is a choice, right? I guess so, yeah. You You can be happy. Or not. And yeah. happiness is uh, a lot to do with your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Joy is different. Joy is something you've got that people can't take away from you. And so 
joy is Jesus, others, and yourself. So yeah. you put yourself last. So in in the mix of all that, being grounded with the character, taking care of other people, and realizing that the reason that we're doing this work is there's families involved. There's people, there is. There's yeah. people that uh, we have very low turnover at our company. Do you? We've got multiple people that have been there 20 plus years. Wow. That's, We've had that's three or great. four retirees. Mm -hmm. We've got our division manager in Raleigh is going to be retiring maybe this year. And he's Tim Larson. He's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Great guy. And, uh, you know, just those people have dedicated their lives to going out of town, doing work and taking care of us. And so it, if we take care of them, that's that's the that's the secret. So just, just keeping taking care of others and and they'll take care of you and everything else takes care of itself that's great so yeah. with that in mind so we talked about a lot of things you do and yeah. how busy you are mm. what's in the future for joel what do you want to do tomorrow what do you want to do moving forward here you know, what does your you want to uh, become a band leader now <clears throat> and do a full-time playing band you want to go back and play ham radio now you're still only 39 years old, so I know you got a lot more years to work. But what's what's on the horizon here for Joel? What's your, what's your quest? I've still got some gas in the tank, yeah. and, and look, getting involved with a lot of the boards, and I serve at my church as an elder as well. Mm -hmm. it, you you learn a lot. You get exposed to a lot of different thought processes and uh, really really sharp people. So I'm I'm enjoying just seeing where the business is going to go next. It's uh, We're constantly trying to develop methods to scale and to grow if, if need be yeah. and to maintain, but to do things with excellence. We don't want to grow at the expense of, no. you know, getting... Got to do it right. Letting quality go. Got to do it right. So I'm enjoying uh, the opportunities to, to learn and to continue improving what we do and working with our people with folks retiring and getting new people, it's almost like starting over in some it, regards, yeah. you know, and it, you just retraining in those mistakes you made. You try not to make them again. So it's fun. You know, you, you, it's a learning process. So, well, I, I see one of the keys where the future's going to go. We'll, see. well I, I, I sense of all the people we've interviewed and mm -hmm. the one key quality that all of you uh, selected entrepreneurs have is uh, a sense of of a community mm. and a sense of uh, networking with your customer and your employees and then sharing this information from as i said your community and all your personal life and your business life yeah. and it seems to wrap the whole thing together there as a as a proper function of of success we've all had our hard times from time to time we all survived well not all of us but we've survived covid yeah. and if you could go on the other side of that situation there, then there's some hope that you'll never have a problem like that, but you'll be able to prosper from that knowledge. So with that in mind, anything you need to add before we, we turn this off? Just thank, thank my family. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Lynn, she's sacrifices a lot, but, cool. you know, and your wife as well, I'm sure. Your wife has a lot of patience. Yeah, she has a <laughs> lot of patience. I've got two wonderful children, John and Elizabeth, uh, 20, 27, 26, and 20, she's 24. So um, they are figuring out their life. And of course, that keeps dad high. Hey, uh, Dad's yeah. always busy. Yeah, dad they, busy. No matter how old they get, they're still your kids. Brent's got some of his kids' furniture in the back back here. <laughs> as, as <far> as. <laughs> no matter how old they are, they're no. still your kids. My mom is 94, and she still tells me what to do. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. That's great. I have, have a great family. My mother's still alive. I get to, she lives close by my sister. I'm just got one sibling and she's amazing. She's uh, 13 months younger than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't kill each other growing up. I don't know how, but she's tougher than I am. She's a lot tougher than I am. Her uh, husband is our estimator. Oh. So I get, okay. get to work with family. I've got a, a nephew, his son helps out as well, and we've got other people in the in the office that help out. Uh, my nephew's wife, so just it's family. It's nice, and I've got a great family, and um, 
very blessed man, you know. Well, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. you coming to visit us today and uh, live long and prosper. Nanu, nanu. <laughs> Take care, Joel. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks for tuning in to another exciting episode of Flowmeter Guy. Want to catch more episodes? Just follow the playlist link right over here. Remember, we need people like you to make this channel a success. If you've got a story to share or have a recommendation for a future episode, drop us a comment below. We'd love to hear from you. Well then, until next time.